I'm Annie. And I'm Leah. And this is Lactation Business Coaching with Annie and Leah, where we talk about the smart way to create a compassionate and professional private practice. Let's dive in. Hey, Annie. Hi, Leah. Ready to talk? I am so excited about today's podcast. I feel like we're really going to reach those people who are just starting out and you can learn from our journey, like skip all the hard stuff and get to the good stuff is what I'm hoping that we'll get to to help all these new LCs starting out. I hope so. And we came up with this idea because it is a question that this, some variation of this question gets asked of me and Leah. And I'm sure any of you that have done this for a while, you know, you've been asked things that, that tie into this category. So we're going to be answering the question, what do you wish you knew when you first started out? But before we do that, Leah has a marketing moment. Yeah. So today we're going to talk about Facebook again. Um, I think it's just such a valuable platform and we want to use it as efficiently as possible. So I'm sure most of you know now that you can touch the three little dots on a post and you can save the post. If it has a link in it, it'll, it'll give you the option to save the link. But another layer to that is when you go to save the link, you can actually separate that into different folders. And what I do is I'm scrolling through Facebook. I have a folder specifically for things that I eventually want to share again on Facebook. Because sometimes an article will make the rounds and everybody's posting it. It'll be really popular. But you could loop it back around a month or two later and it'll be really popular again. And you started it that time. Uh, So what I do is I put that in my little folder. So just as I'm going in, it's so, so fast. And then I know it's all categorized. So I don't have to scroll through everything I save, like every recipe I saw and every cute idea that somebody posted. It's just a folder just for that. So it has saved me so much time when I'm going back and I'm like, oh, I need to share something. Then I just have like, like my whole list is already done. And it's a great way to just get more content. That's a great one because I save things in Facebook all the time and never go back to them. So I know if I had folders, I would go back to them. And yeah, because they're more they're more organized. So you're like, okay, I'm looking for recipes for tonight's dinner. Okay, well, I have a whole folder for just recipes, and then I have, you know, a whole whole folder for this kind of content stuff. And I like you how you're applying that to finding ideas about things to share on Facebook. And you might even find you saved something from a long time ago because you liked it and maybe it didn't really get shared widely. And you you could say, you know, it doesn't have to be brand new to be worthy of sharing. So you might say, Absolutely. Oh, you know, I want to share this today or something that's like never gets old. So that's a great one. So yeah. keeping track of stuff. I'm a fan of anything that gets you more organized. So yes. um, let's talk about what, what do you wish you knew when you first got started? And we've talked, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the business of being a lactation consultant and, and how important it is to be mindful about how you're, you're structuring your business. But as far as what that actually looks like, and we both feel like sometimes the best way to learn is by seeing what mistakes people made and and where they got off on the wrong foot. So, you know, any business owner will have those stories and so today we're hoping you can learn from some of the things that w- we did or didn't do in the beginning and um, maybe even save you from making some of the mistakes that we made. Yeah. So we're trying um, to save you from having to go down the bumpy path that we have all journeyed along. <laughs> so I would say, okay, so one of them, when you were just saying like organization and learning and everything in the beginning, and this might be just because I was doing more just paper charting in the beginning. So I had like everything paper and we had like a million handouts and trying to like keep track of what handouts and what needed to be printed off and what I didn't have. And then I wouldn't have what I needed when I was there. So I love being paperless and being able to send my care plans with just attachments that I'm not having to like figure out Mm -hmm. printing. And, and the other thing I'll say is a lot of families really appreciate this too. Cause I remember when I was doing like lots of paper handouts and my families would get back to me and be like, Oh, I know you left something with, you know, what we're supposed to do with the bottle feeding, but I can't, I can't find it. Can you send it to me again? And I'm like, uh, 
okay, you know, and then I'm like having to do extra steps to like resend this thing that I just left at their house. So they're like, oh, somebody threw it away or we can't find it. Or And on that, sometimes some of those paper handouts that you can buy have copyright on them that prohibits you from sending electronically. So some of them, you might not have permission to scan it and email it to a client. Yes. Yeah. So, so I, that was totally the case. Cause I have, um, uh, I have two or three, like I had a paste bottle feeding one handout that was like that. Like you could, I'm like, Oh, I can't send it to you now, you know, or I have, so to, I have to like, to you. yeah, or I have to like find other resources. And so that was just always so complicated. So I'm so happy now. And I actually funnily, Fun, that's not a word. Um, <laughs> ironically, is what I want to say. Found this. I was cleaning out some folders, and I found this like giant folder that I had shoved like in the bottom of my filing cabinet with just like a thousand random oh. printed handouts. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this is still shoved in the back of here. So it was, it was liberating. I put it in the big recycle box, and I was like, you are gone. Be free with the other pieces of paper that are being recycled (laughs) because I was so happy to let that all go. So that's something that I can definitely say uh, changed over the lifetime of my practice and really has helped me stay more organized and more efficient is to really utilize being more paperless with not just my charting, but also my handouts and like what I'm sharing with families and having it all be electronic now is really great. It is really worth taking the time. And if you have to find a way to carve out, you know, three or four hours to just sit there and say, what, how am I going to organize myself? Make yourself some folders in, if you've got G suite, then you've got the Google drive. And, um, if you're in the U S and need it to be HIPAA compliant, uh, you, the drive is HIPAA compliant. So what folders do I want in there? Do I want one for handouts? Do I want one for letters? Do I want one for marketing? Do I want one for pediatrician reports? So kind of thinking through like, where are the different, what are the different buckets that I can put things in and make folders for them? Dropbox also has HIPAA compliant option. Um, you have to fill out a form and sign it and send it and mail it into them or fax it to them, but you can have HIPAA, Dropbox be HIPAA compliant too. Uh, if, if that's something that you need. And, um, I, I'm pretty organized digitally. So my, my computer, I know where everything is. Also, don't be afraid to use the search feature when you're trying to, when you're not, if you're like, I'm 80% organized, but I know I've got some p- things in the wrong spot. Uh, computer search features are really powerful for finding information quickly. So, but you have to know what's there. You have to at least know that it's in there. So my um, supplies is where I'm always like, ah, I've got two gloves left. Oh my gosh, <laughs> and, um, yes. I didn't order them on time. And so I'm, I wish I had, I wish my consult bag was like one of those smart refrigerators so that when I go to open it, it's like, Annie, it's time to reorder gloves or Annie, did you know you're running low on five French feeding tubes? So it's, uh, that that would be so amazing. Somebody invents it. Um, I will totally, um, okay. I have a side question for you. Yeah. Oh, uh, what kind of glove, what gloves do you use? I get the ones on Amazon. I get the purple ones, the nitro. Yes, that's what I used to. But this is, um, I recently had somebody brought it up on a Facebook group about those gloves. The babies don't taste them good, taste good. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've had a couple of, like, I was like, I think every baby I've had since I bought this new box has made a face. (laughs) <laughs> them, and I wonder if they change something and they don't taste good to the babies. So I know I, I wonder is, are oh. yours dark purple or light purple? They're like in between. I don't okay. know. So mine are really, really dark purple. Oh, okay. I think I they're the wrong ones. Yeah. I need to, I don't even know the brand. I was just curious because I went to a client's house that she was like a nurse and she had this other box of gloves that were nitro gloves and they were way cheaper, but those, they were blue. And I, definitely felt like those tasted they terrible. Tasted they bad. even kind of had like a smell. Like, ooh, a, I don't know. I was no. just like, Ooh, I don't like those. No, so I've never had a problem with the other ones. I've never had a problem with the purple ones, but, but this time I did. So I don't know. I'm going to have to check my new box. I just got a new box too. So I totally agree with the inventory thing. And now that I have an assistant, we actually run an inventory list and then, so because, smart. and then I have more, more than one consultant. So it's not just me. And so we, she'll check in. She'll be like, Hey guys, 
can you give me your inventory list? And we just check off like, okay, I need this. I need this, you know, and, and let her know, okay, I'm running low on this and that. And she'll, and then she orders it for us. So it's so awesome. But oh, having good. a list of what you're going to have in your bag and how, how much you want to have of those in your bag, I think is really, really helpful. And then I have of your um, glove situation. I carry a tote in my in my car because I can't carry everything in my bag. So I carry a tote in my car. Um, like I have an emergency like hand pump um, that's sterile, like a sterile pack hand pump because if I walk in and I don't know, I just feel like, oh my gosh, there mm-hmm. might be a chance that I would need an emergency hand pump. So I have, but I don't want to carry that in my bag because it mm-hmm. takes so much space. So anyway, I just have like a stash and in there I have like super cheap, tiny box of like my emergency gloves. Cause I have had that happen where I've rolled up in a consult and I'm like, oh my gosh, I have like one set of gloves left or something. So I at all times have my backup gloves just in case. I do backup gloves too. I buy, when I refresh, I buy two and one goes in my consult bag and the other one goes in my car. Yes. So I have to deal with it every time I deal with the trunk of my car. And then when I, when I'm like, oh, I don't, once that one goes into my bag, theoretically, that's like, the trigger to trigger. Make order two more box, box. but <laughs> theoretically, yes. Yeah. I love um, that the spreadsheet idea. And there's so many different ways that you could share that and make it accessible by everyone. I I really need to do something like that. I, I have to fit everything in one bag because if I'm parking, sometimes I'm, I have to walk 10 to 15 minutes from where I park. Oh yeah. And then you can't just go back out. You can't just like run down to my car. So, um, I've really scaled down. I do, um, keep a change of clothes in my car. Um, I learned that the hard way. Been pooped on a few times. <laughs> I, got, I got pooped on by a twin. And the reason we realized the twin pooped on me is because the other twin started laughing hysterically. <laughs> and I was like, some comedy is an older baby. They were like five months old. And I was like, this oh. is hilarious and amazing. But I love that like the sister was like, tee hee. <laughs> you just got pooped on. <laughs> that is hilarious. I've been pooped on, peed on puked on pretty much all the ones. I've even been like hosed with a uh, overactive letdown. Oh, uh-huh. Yep. Yep. It's been messy. totally hosed down. <laughs> so I definitely agree with the extra set of clothes in the car is super, super important. The, 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 val- the bag, I think that's another thing I could say is that in the beginning, I, and I think we might've mentioned this on the podcast before, like buy all the things. And you know, like, you just like go crazy on Amazon. Like I'm going to need like every, everything that's breastfeeding related or bottle feeding related, like, and put it all in my bag. And what you realize is that you really don't use that much. You're going to have like mm-hmm. a handful of supplies, but I, my bag does not have that much in it anymore. Whereas in the beginning, I was carrying around so much stuff that like literally I never touched. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. like I thought I needed because I just like, oh, someday. Uh, does know. your bag get heavier every time you go to a consult? I mean, uh, not a consult. <laughs> I'll start that over. A conference. Do you find your bag gets heavier every time you go to a conference? Yeah. <laughs> Yes. You're like, oh, now I need to get this and this and this. But I really now have pared down my bag. Like I used to carry a small, like literally luggage bag that had wheels because I thought that would be Mm -hmm. super helpful. But I was just, the issue was I was carrying so much Uh stuff that I was like never, ever getting to use. So that would be another like wish I had known. I didn't need to buy all a stuff. million, billion things and carry that all around. And I've even heard of like lactation consultants carrying like breastfeeding pillows and stuff with them. I couldn't imagine carrying that. That, in. that would be unfeasible for me. Yeah. Like I couldn't I imagine carry, having all that. I do carry a baby doll. Um, yes, I do too. And Back when I had children who were potty and training, I was carrying Chuck's pads just because I was buying them for home too. <laughs> yeah, but, um, to put under their under their sheets and their beds. But I don't do that anymore either. I use what they have. But I got a very tiny baby doll, so it doesn't. The, so I'm always like, here's my here's my very preterm baby. That yeah, I'm very very preterm. But, um, it fits in the bag. <laughs> it's better. It's I couldn't. The big baby doll was like I don't I don't know walking around with the baby doll hanging out of my bag. It's like. <laughs> It's just weird. Or like if it's in the front seat of my car. Like, I know. I always think about like somebody's going to break the window and be like, you're the baby. 
like, oh, it's just a doll. I do uh, have one that I use for my teaching classes. And one time my mom got in the car and like like an arm and a leg were like hanging out oh, of gosh. the bag. And she was like, Leo, oh my gosh, you cannot do that. Even though I know you don't have a baby. She's like, that is so traumatizing. Like <laughs> you have to put that baby like where we can't see it. It was so funny because I didn't realize like, the re- I, I just know it's a baby doll, but she was right. Like, she was over like, whoa, that's too much. Well, it's like that moment I've, I've had this recently, uh, where the client had a a high chair, and she had a teeny baby, but she had a high chair. And she had a baby doll in the high chair, and she had it every time I went to see her. I saw her four times, and every time I did this double take, I'm like, this ba- why is this five week old in the high chair? <laughs> Not the high chair yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> too soon. Too soon. And you're like, oh, it's just a baby doll. I'm like, that's an interesting oh. decor choice that really like yes. freaked out the lactation consultants. So yes. Absolutely. Well, another is- thing I wish I knew when I was first starting out was where I should most effectively market myself. And yes. you know, part of it just was like, I was a little scared to market myself because I was new, but also like, wh- where is the best place to find people? And my husband had, he's uh, also a small business owner. And he said something to me very early on where he was like, I know your problem. Your problem is that it's all new business. And for the the most part, that's true. You know, I do. Oh my gosh. It is like a gift from the world that when somebody says, I want to have you come back, I'm having my second baby. And they actually call you and you get to go and see them again. And you get to see the, hopefully get to see the first babies, like a cute toddler now. I know, I like it's that. just, those are the best visits, but most, you know, that's like a handful. And most of them are people that have to find me cold and people Mm -hmm. that sometimes don't even know that they need a lactation consultant. And so I started out, I feel like the mistake I made was by starting out marketing myself on parenting groups that I was in myself from having my own kids. So already I had an in that if, if you're, if you don't have children, then, you know, you're not part of those parenting groups and some of them won't let you in they'll ask you questions like, do you actually have children? And they won't right. let you in or they, or they don't want anybody in doing marketing. So they're like, don't tell us about your businesses. So there could be some kind of really weird rules with those parenting groups. You also open yourself up in the parenting groups to getting people asking you for free help or the mini consult that yes. um, is a bad idea. So um, when he told me that about new, it's all new business and how hard I was working for so little reward, I was like, let me rethink, like, how can I get to this new business? How can I like warm this market up a little bit? And so I started marketing. I sent a bunch of letters to pediatricians. And I also really thought about my pediatrician report as a marketing tool. And Mm. so in the early days, I was spending way more time on my pediatrician report than I am now because I really wanted to impress these pediatricians with like, look yeah. how I know and look how much <laughs> I'm doing and, and all of that. So those are some things I kind of learned in my first like year or two of private practice is the best way to market myself. I mean, I know you're the marketing <laughs> expert, but um, wow. I just, I had a different approach just because of my background. Like I had done medical sales in the past and had just literally would go door to door to physicians offices and what I would call beat the streets. I would just, Mm -hmm. you you know, pull them all up, go to every single one. Maybe a few would um, click, but that was something that I did early on is that I really made a lot of face-to-face contact with everybody in the community from pediatricians to doulas to midwives to like literally anyone. Like I even do still to this day, I do a little like class like a really like literally 15 to 30 minute, like what's the top thing you need to know um, for a fitness of like a mom fitness group. (laughs) And I mean, like I saturated like every avenue that you could possibly hear about, um, you know, would have pregnant moms there or new moms there. I tried to get in front of and really face to face because I felt like it just so solidifies you're a real person and you're out there. So I would highly recommend anybody starting out to take the leap. It's so hard to do, I know, because it's really intimidating, but to go and get in front of people face-to-face. I feel like that was really impactful on my journey as a businesswoman. Was That's a good really one because, part. you know, I think it's, it's going to be scary. Maybe the first couple of times you do it, especially if you're not really a natural marketer, you know, or not somebody who wants to do it, but you know, you can kind of just set yourself up and say, you know, the first time I do this, it's probably going to be horrible, but that's fine because 
Just like if you're trying to learn how to ice skate, you learn by falling down. Uh, you're going to learn by doing it wrong and, or doing it the, not the way you would want to do it in the future. And just um, keep, keep changing what you're doing based on how the last one went. Do it a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Time. The other thing that helped me, because this is one of the things that I learned just in my sales, you know, training was that it's, it's more of a numbers game than every single one of them is going to go perfectly right. Like every single one of them will not go right. You just have to get enough of them. And then the, there will be a ratio of ones that go right and ones that go wrong and, or not go wrong, but you just don't get the feedback that you hoped or you don't get referrals that you hope for. So it's more of a numbers game. So just push yourself to get the volume of reaching out to more and more people in mm-hmm. your community versus every single one of these has to go perfect. And if I do three of them and they're all not great, but if you do six of them and two of them are great, you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. there's really this, uh, this numbers game to it and that can kind of take the pressure off. So I think marketing, we've talked about this before too, but like buying tons and tons of marketing materials, like I'm going to get all the pamphlets and the handouts and the, um, you know, fancy trifolds and all this stuff that sometimes, uh, the paper stuff just doesn't, just doesn't pay out Mm -hmm. as much as you would hope it would. It looks beautiful. They usually Mm -hmm. are lovely and Mm -hmm. they're fun to design and Mm -hmm. look at, but I have found them to not be. So we really cut back on like our paper stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, like, even if you felt like you didn't have the most, you weren't like the zazziest person of yourself, a version of yourself when you saw that pediatrician and you, you feel like, Oh, I really like was tripping over my own words and didn't represent myself. You're going to back that up. Hopefully, you know, that's not the last chance you have with those people. You can do things like send a regular newsletter, like write some things up for pediatricians about like, here's, here's some new research on breastfeeding. Have you seen this yet? And there's, um, that can be a great thing to send out just like, you know, every other month or four times a year, twice a year, just to put yourself in front of people. My husband has, he sends two emails a year. Um, So he does lighting rental and lighting work for film and television. So twice a year, he sends one email to uh, everyone, all the producers and DPs and everybody he works with just to say, I've updated my gear list. Here's where it is. Now he's got a very different, like they're expecting different things from him, but, but he's like, he just like twice a year, I'm going to just put myself top of mind to you again in this way. Mm. And so that's, you know, just because you walked in the door and they were like, roll their eyes at you or, you know, put their cards in a drawer and like, you haven't heard from them since you walked in. That doesn't mean what it does not mean is that they were like, Oh, Annie Frisbee, lactation consultant. I'm never going to call her. They forgot about you. Yeah. So remind them of you. Yeah. I think, um, I used to send, if I did actually speak to anybody other than just the receptionist, which is like a lot of times just the case, you're going to just speak to the receptionist and hand them stuff to take back to the doctor. But whenever I got in front of somebody from the office, I always sent a thank you note. And That's so great. it's like solid, a handwritten thank you note, uh-huh. um, that, you know, it was just like, thank you so much for taking the time. And I really appreciate it. And I look forward to collaborating with mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. in the future. And, um, so that was always a really powerful marketing tip as well. That's but great. The, I know one of the other things that I was glad that I had did, and I'm now glad that I do even more was to really connect with other lactation consultants. Mm-hmm. Um, and not just from our area, but ones that have expertise in different areas. I mean, I can say, we're all happy to help and support the next person. And I wish that I had maybe more confidence in calling or asking for mentors, not mentorship, like officially, but like, Hey, I'm dealing with this really challenging case. Would you talk through with me? Like sometimes as a new LC, that's really intimidating, you know, to call somebody who maybe you look up to and you're like, they're not going to want to take the time to talk to me. But what I have found over the years, I've done more and more of that. And one, I've learned so much. And two, you know, they're usually so happy and willing to help. And it's such a w- great way to grow your knowledge base is by hearing what other, other approaches would be or other ideas, that kind of thing. 
Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And I used to think in the beginning, well, first, because I was new, but then even as I got more experience, I, I was like, you know, people would ask, Can, will you be my mentor? I'm trying to become a lactation consultant through Pathway 3 and I need a mentor. And I was like, I can't do that because, you know, honestly, teaching... It's not my the, the thing that brings me joy. I don't I think there are people that are way better at it than me. And it's also just because of my schedule and the thin margins I have because of homeschooling my kids. What I don't have time for is let's have regular meetings to go over your learning objectives. Like I can't <laughs> right. do that. And I and I I can't charge you enough to like I don't want like what I would need to charge you for my time is not what I think any student lactation consultant should be paying for mentorship. So and that only has to do with my schedule and and how I can't, I have these family obligations that prevent me from being able to give all the time that I think a mentor pathway three mentor needs to give. Then I had somebody reach out and say, I'm, I am a lactation consultant, but I've only worked in a hospital. Can I follow you and watch you do home visit and see how you do it? And I'm like, that's yes. Like that, sure. That, that works. Like you're just going to come, you're just going to observe and, I don't have to, like, we can talk about it afterwards, but I don't have, I'm not responsible for like learning objectives. I also don't have to give you a chance to do hands-on work. Like you're just watching. Mm, Yeah. And, um, and I had that happen. That was great. And we had like an amazing vibe with this client there. I ended up, I think uh, the lactation consultant came, the IBCLC came with me for four visits and wow. It was so nice having her there that the client is now going to become a lactation consultant. And I just, oh my gosh, that. that's so awesome. So that was like super cool. I mean, I think yes. she would have done it whether, but I was like, I bet, I bet seeing two of us kind of brought her to that point of like, this is cool. And it's nice when I have the hospital ones come because then if I'm like, I, um, have never worked in a hospital and, and I have two children who were both born at home. So I've also never personally experienced hospital birth. So everything I know about it is like what I hear yeah, uh, but I I've learned what my clients have told me, but I also I know I bring a tremendous bias of like, which is tempered by the fact that I have made connections with hospital lactation consultants who have really changed my perspective on what happens in the hospital for the good. So now I'm like I have like every benefit of the doubt. Like when somebody tells me the hospital lactation consultant was like this, I'm like what she heard and what was actually said are two different things. And now I understand why I was like, why don't they all teach laid back in the hospital? And then (laughs) I had breakfast with some of my colleagues who work in the hospital. And she's like, because the babies are drugged and can't move, laid back is too comfortable for these babies. I was like, oh, I never thought about that because I've never seen a day one baby. Yeah. Yeah. Except for my own. And so that collaboration. I mean, that's something that I just think is so, so valuable if you're starting out, collaborating with other LCs, collaborating with other, like you've done in, you know, hospital LCs, if you don't have experience in that. Uh, I think those things can be so powerful in shaping your practice and your knowledge base. And, um, and these biases that we all come into this with, that, you know, helps us see the other side of things. Is there anything else, Annie, that you can think of that you're like, oh, I wish I knew this early on? I guess I would say one last thing that I wish I had known when I first started out, which is something I did do when I first started out, but I think I did it because I I like it and not really realizing how glad I would be that I did it. So I... um just did all the conferences. And then I kept doing them even after I had my 70, 75 SERPs to recertify just because yes. I personally like conferences. And now that I've been doing this for, um, I'm past my recertification, I've gotten hooked on conferences. So even oh, though, yes. unless Ible C changes their rules, I'm going to have to recertify by exam in 2021. I'm still going to the conferences. I'm still watching gold. I'm still watching. I like, oh, yes. and, and so I'm really glad I got myself like basically hooked on conferences starting in year one of my private practice because I, now I, it's just always good. And I would say like, if you're planning to go into private practice, you need to have a plan for your ongoing training 
through, I mean, of course we have to get it through SERPs, but there's just another level of that. Like if you're in the hospital, oftentimes they're providing a lot of training, a lot of structure, but you have to provide that on your own and you have to take the time to make that happen because you can really stagnate in your skills and in your knowledge base um, because the field of lactation is growing and we're learning more and it's always changing. And if you want to be well-respected and sought after, you really have to make a commitment to almost creating your own ongoing curriculum of how you're going to up your skills over and over and over um, because it's always it's always changing. And it's I think that really... Changing. And it does cost really is money. Important. So you're going to need to have a budget and yes, to understand that that is a business expense. I would also say like on the specific point, if you see any opportunity to get training on um, being inclusive or on diversity or on cultural ro- obstacles, either to people get breastfeed, meeting their breastfeeding goals or to people becoming lactation consultants at any price, pay the money for that yeah, or, for sure. uh, or pay for, you know, pay for that class or pay for that in-person workshop or bring someone yourself because that is a place where big changes are happening for the better. Um, but it's not anything that is going to be part of your curriculum to pass the exam yeah. in, a, in a meaningful way that actually is going to affect your practice and how you talk with people. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree with that. Awesome. Well, as we wrap up with all this great information, I know that you also have a tech tip for us today. Annie, what you got? I do. I have a tech tip, which is about the consent for care. So I hope that you're all having a consent for care um, written by an attorney or purchasing one that um, some of the ones that are for sale out on the market where you can buy a consent for care that's just for lactation. And I was, what I realized very quickly was that it was really hard to get people to sign it in like before I got there. And then I real I just started being like, I just really want this before I even walk in the door. Um, because I don't know, I started to learn, like there's going to be times where the baby is crying and, and I don't want to have to have them sign a consent form while their baby's crying hungry. I really wanted it in advance. So I rethought about not using my platform to get the consent, but rather using online, the online scheduler that I'm using to get that consent in advance. And so I've changed my policy so that I do not go to anyone's house without a consent for care signed. So the tech tip is if you're using Acuity, you can put your consent for care in as an intake, but you're not going to choose intake question. You're going to choose, it'll say new terms and conditions and you click that and you paste your consent in there and then they have they get to init- or they get to check the box that they've signed it and as long as you're using um, in the US if you need to be HIPAA compliant as long as you're using the powerhouse player level um, that's going to be HIPAA compliant you're going to have an audit trail a record that they're the person who signed it and then you're free to go to that visit I'm sure that there are other HIPAA compliance schedulers who will offer similar features. Acuity is the one that I'm personally comfortable with, but you can even do it um, through, if you have a G Suite form, you could get it that way, set it up as a form that they need to sign through your HIPAA compliant G Suite and have them just sign that when you say, okay, great, I'm coming Tuesday at 10. Um, I'm going to send you an email with a link, click that link to sign my consent in advance. And you can make it really simple. The consent can just be that one question. I just want you to sign that you're okay with me coming and you're okay with the things that are going to happen in the visit. And then whatever else, at least you have that. I would also recommend adding like payment policies to that too. It's never a bad idea to ask them to sign those right before you do anything with them. But, but the main one is the consent for care. So, um, that's my tech tip. And so thank you so much for that great information. I was taking down notes as you were saying it. <laughs> I think that's a great, great way to um, ensure that those things are all being covered each time we go and visit a family. So thank you so much for that. Well, this has been an awesome talk, Annie, and I look forward to our next chat together. I do too. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a great week with consults. Do you have anything you're looking forward to this week? Um, No, just a busy week. Uh, we just are filled up. I think January can sometimes be slow for us, but this this time of year, um, this year, we're staying pretty steady. So um, I definitely think that, uh, yeah, it's going to be a busy week. How about you? I have a busy week too. And it's the same. We're recording this episode in January and I'm used to a slowdown. Um, And I have 
babies coming out of my ears. I don't really know what's going on. And I'm not the only one I know from our WhatsApp group um, for the other New York City lactation consultants. But um, so I've got some fun follow-ups this week and um, people I'm looking forward to going back and seeing again. I've got one of my, one of my clients this week is someone who I saw with their first baby and I get to see them again. And, and she and I just had a great rapport. So it's always, yeah, they're all, I think my visits this week are, I have only one initial, the rest are follow-ups. So I've only, um, I kind of like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll, it'll be good. And, uh, yeah. So Awesome. I don't know. Just, uh, you know, send me good vibes for finding parking at all of my various. <laughs> I definitely and, will. And picture me, picture me eating salad in my car. <laughs> Cause that's, I think that's what my Tuesday will be like. Yes. Oh man. I know that feeling. I know that feeling. Well, it's been great talking to you. I hope you have a great week and me too. look forward to see, talking to you again soon. Yep. To the next time. Bye. Right. Bye. Thanks for listening to Lactation Business Coaching with Annie and Leah. If you like this podcast, please leave us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you're listening right now. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode.